It is great to be with you. We've been friends with your pastor, uh, Mike and Karen, for a long time now, and uh, just been consistent and steady, listening for God and then doing what God says. I mean, that's, that's kind of what this church is known for. Listen to God, do what God says, and then uh, God shows up and does what he does. Our challenge today is, you know, how do you build a strong church? I want to kind of talk to you about that. And uh, I've got a couple that's going to come up. Uh, Steve O'Mara is one of our graduates from Leaders for Christ Training Center. He's with us today over here. And then Allie and Andy uh, are with us, Mahoney from uh, Bay City. And uh, they're in our training center right now. And I'm going to have them come up in a few moments, give you a, a quick testimony about their lives. But if you have your Bibles today, why don't you turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go to a familiar passage, but I want to help try to maybe shine some light on this. I think a lot of people today... Um, don't realize that uh, uh, the Bible is a whole lot more kingdom than we give it. And so a lot of people don't know why a kingdom is important and, and how do we fit into a kingdom and what does it make? Because we're, we're from America, we don't really understand uh, a kingdom. But, uh, you know, for instance, let me give you a good example. You know, when you come into the church, most people don't realize this. Why do we take up an offering? You ever thought about that? Why do we give offerings at church or why do we bring an offering? In England, if you were to go to visit the queen, everyone that comes before the queen has to bring a gift. It's protocol. When you come into the presence of a king or a queen, you present them with a gift. So we, are, we have the king of kings. And so every, every week, some people, well, why do we give offerings? We are honoring our king with a gift. And what that does, it, it just it sets our attitude right and it opens up the doors or the windows of heaven to bring a blessing on us. And so we think, okay, well, I didn't know that. I didn't think that was kingdom stuff. That's kingdom stuff. That's why we do it. So let's take a look. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll start verse 11. And the Bible says, He gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, uh, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So God was saying to the early church that I am going to send you gifts. And this is, this, this is a challenge with kingdom because in America we think, well, we, we usually have one gift. We get one pastor and that he's supposed to take care of everything. That's not what the Bible taught. The Bible taught us that there are five of these gifts with different functions. They weren't titles they were to come alongside and equip the saints, get the saints prepared, get them ready to fulfill what God called them to do. Ephesians says that you and I were created before the foundations of the world to walk in good works, which means God already knew that there was some cool stuff that you were gonna, uh, he created for you to do, but you're going to need to be equipped by this, these five-fold ministry gifts. Well, we start playing games with our ego and we say, well, who's the, who's the best gift? And is that the apostle or is that the evangelist or is, it must be the pastor because that seems like the only position that's paid for in the church is the pastor. So that's got to be the best gift. And God says, well, hold on a minute. What I want to do is remember if he's an equipping gift, a really good pastor is not going to do all the work in the ministry. He's going to train other people to do that work. Now, the work of a pastor is to give care to other people. Okay, now your pastor has a gift mix, we call it. Uh, he would be both a pastor and a prophetic gift. And so the prophetic gift always points to life. Wherever there's life, that's where I want to go. I want to go where the life is. And so all of a sudden, you began to recognize these gifts were given to the church to equip us. And that's a different perspective than, let's just go to church. God never intended that you would come to a church and sit on your butt and say, yay, that was good today. But that's what we've turned it into. I mean, our pastors today have to be like, uh, you know, late night talk show hosts. They gotta be funny, they gotta be clever, they gotta be cool, they gotta wear the right outfit. No, 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 no. I know he's anointed because we both wear boots. That's how I know he's anointed. <laughs> <sighs> so the whole concept of the local church is that what if, what, can, let me say this, what if, that God was saying, I need then a pe person who had a heart for evangelism. See, everyone should have a heart for the lost, right? But not everyone's an evangelist, but the evangelist is the equipper of the saints to reach the lost. The prophetic gift, if you're a prophet, it's not so, you're, you're, you're Mr. You know, big boy and you get to prophesy, it's I'm going to equip the saints to understand the Lord's voice and to equip them to prophesy. 
If I'm going to be a teacher, I'm going to be a good teacher. I'm going to learn that. But the fact is, I want to teach other people how to, how to teach the word on line upon line, uh, precept upon precept. I want them to be good at being able to know the Bible and, 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 and teach it. Some people say it this way, that um, uh, oftentimes educators take things that are simple and they make them difficult. Communicators want to take things that are, are complex and make them simple. Because it's not about how much you know, it's about who you know, Jesus, and it's about being able to do what the Word says. So today's teaching is going to really be about equipping you to be able to, to reach our world in a way that maybe we didn't think. So let's, let's keep going. If I was going to build a church today, I want to build a church on these five healthy church systems. And I know it's going to be boring for a minute, but hang on. I think we've got some encouragement for you. The systems that we need to build is what I would call leadership system. There's got to be a leadership system in every church. Now, the leadership system is in reference to the apostle. Okay, the apostle means sent one. God usually sends somebody to do what he wants them to do, and, and there's got to be a strong uh, leadership system in the life of the church in order for the church to, to fulfill its purpose. The second thing is the spiritual life. Uh, the prophetic gift is the one that points to the spiritual life. What is God saying today? It's over here. What is God doing today? It's over here. What does God want us to do here? Not trying to duplicate what someone else is doing by reading a book, but what is God saying to Life Song Church? And how are we supposed to fulfill that? I, I, re I was here. I remember when the, I drove up and there was a barn in the parking lot. Remember those days? There was a barn in the parking lot, and it wasn't even my favorite barn. It was one of those round barns. Remember the, the ones that kind of, I think the ones you just store vegetables in or something. I don't know. No room for the cows in there, I don't think, because it's, it's just round. Anyway, so I come, and I'm like here, but I heard Pastor Mike, and he starts talking about the vision about what he wants to do and what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. We ain't got no money even, but I'm, we're going to do bike. And he, you know how he is. He just goes and goes and goes. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He just, he just rides the... Anyway, so I'm like, this is awesome. There's nothing here but an old barn. And yet there's life. And he started pointing to where we were going. And next thing you know, uh, things are going up. This is going to be a kid's room. We're going to expand this. We're going to add the barn this way. And, and all of a sudden, you begin to realize... This guy's the real deal. He not only just said, I know lots of dreamers, but they never do anything. But there's people who have dreams from God, and then they do what God tells them to do, and we see the manifestation of it. And so that's why we've been friends all these years. We want to help each other in the kingdom process. So outreach is the third one. Leadership, spiritual life, outreach. Outreach in a community is from the evangelist. Congregational care, that is the gift of a pastor. They say that one pastor really can't give great care to over 100, 150 people. So he must go from a pastor who's a shepherd, listen, to a rancher. I have to raise up under shepherds who can actually help me take care of all that. So there's a bunch of you in this room who love caring for people. That would be under the pastoral ministry. There's people in this room that have a passion to, for outreach. You would be underneath the evangelistic ministry. Are you, are you tracking with me? All of a sudden, you, there's room for all of us. There's people for the teachers. Uh, the next gift was um, personal growth because teachers are interested that each individual within a group of people are growing and developing in their, in their gifts and their calling. So now when I say apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, what I'm really trying to say is the healthy systems are leadership, spiritual life, outreach, congregational care, and personal growth. Now, since all of us don't have those five titles, God may send a leader, and that's what we're waiting for. And this morning in the early service, I don't know if you were here or not, I don't know if it's on the video, but we actually, after 20 years of Gary's faithfulness here at the church and him prophesying to, to Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, we're going to start a church, right? He goes, yeah, but you're going to be the pastor. Thank you, Gary. That's not how it works, right? He just comes out and says it. Well, it came to pass. Here we are 20 years later. But today was interesting because Pastor Mike told me 20 years from today, we just ordained Gary as one of the pastor administrative shepherds here for this house. Now you say, well, what's new? He's been doing that already. Exactly. We weren't acknowledging that he's done it. What we're saying is we were confirming that, that he's already been doing it. It's not a title. It's a function. We're recognizing the function. So here's what I know about Gary. 
Gary is going to train up a whole bunch of people, listen, who think organization, administration. Anybody organize and administrative in here? How many, listen, how many, how, many, how many ladies in here in your closet, all your shoes are perfectly in order? She's probably going to be on his team, okay? See Gary after the service. Now, those of you that just throw all your shoes in there and they're piled up and, and in bags, right? Uh, it's probably not on the organization team. That's all I'm saying. I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you. You can go buy another pair today and just throw them in there. I get it. Okay, but you're probably not going to be on the organizational administration team. Okay, that's just what I'm saying to you. Now, you might say, oh, I love this shoe and I love that. You might be on the pastoral team because you're going to have to love everybody. Okay? All right. Oh, I like all the colors and I like the different size heels and I. Oh, brother. Go, go, go love somebody. Get out of the way. All right. <laughs> so. So we, so think about this. If you've got five systems, my job is to make sure that I make piles. Piles of outreach, piles of pastoral care, piles of teachers, piles of administrators, piles of prophetic life. And then the goal is how to, how to keep you united and how to work together and how to build teams and how to have fun. I don't have to go to church. I can't wait to get to church because I get to be with other people who are part of my passion. Somebody say amen to that. So here's the challenge. I think it was Martin Luther who said, he said uh, that, that Christians without skills uh, are really a detriment to the church. What he was trying to say there is that since we were all created for the foundations of the earth, God is wanting Christians, listen, Christians to really develop three things. This is why I come to church. This is why hopefully you come to church. The first one is to develop your character. Look at somebody and say, I think you're a character. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, the idea of character is, is not just what you see. It's what's happening underneath in their life. And God is wanting a personal, individual relationship with you where you are personally being developed by him. You're his son. You're his daughter. And Christ is committed to working all of you out of you and putting him in you. Does that make sense? So that takes a level of commitment because when you say Jesus is Lord, you're not just saying he's just Savior. You're saying Jesus is Lord of every area of my life and I want to submit to him because he knows what's best for me and I want him to work in me so that whatever he wants, I say yes. So you may never need to go to Romania with me on a trip, but I know this, in your heart, if God were to ask you to, I, there needs to be a yes. You may never have to do it. I've been trying to get Steve with me to California now for the last how many years, Steve? You know, I want to go, Pastor. I want, one of these days he's going to go with me. But here's the idea. Even if you never go, he's going to probably say to me one day, Pastor, you know I'd go with you if the Lord wanted me to. And I go, I know you would, Steve. Then he'd be done. He'd be over. I wouldn't ask him again. Because it's not just what you do. It's your heart, right? Some of you, well, I, I, I'm not worthy. I don't, who, who told you you weren't worthy? You weren't worthy. The Bible says you've been made worthy by the blood. Nothing you can do to make you worthy. It's only what Jesus did makes you worthy. So if God's calling you to do something, he makes you worthy. So God says, listen, I, I'm going to send you to a church. I want you to have a personal relationship with me. And there's going to be leaders in the church. And they're going to teach you. They're going to model for you. I don't know if you, let me say it this way. When a person receives Christ, we get a new father. Isn't that good news? There's no perfect father, but I get a heavenly father now who's going to father me. And I'm thankful to the Lord. I came to the Lord at 18 years old, and uh, I had a lot of father wounds and brokenness, and, and the heavenly father began to refather me. And then he put me in a church, and I get new brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that cool? Now I get a new family. Not only do I get a father, I get a new family. And so I go, wow, I don't have to go to church. I want to go to church because I get to be with my family. So God says, the reason why you need family, I don't know about you, but I've been with my family, my natural family, and I don't know about you, but we would learn how to fight but not quit on each other. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You and your sister or brother might fight like cats and dogs, but you still love each other. Hopefully you don't leave each other every time something goes on, right? You, you work it out, you deal with it. See, that's different than people who just, I'll be your friend until you do something I don't like, and then I write you off. So God says that development is, is, is in your character. The best way to describe character or 
integrity would, would be that if you had an oak table in your living room and you drilled a hole through the oak with a drill, you just put a drill hole through it, and you'd look at the, the, the drill hole and you'd find out whether it's integrity, whether it's oak all the way through, or if it's an outer coating of oak, but on the inside it's particle board. God doesn't want his kids to be particle board. He wants them to be the same people on the outside as they are on the inside. And this is why the character formation is so important. How do you learn character? Faithfulness. Thank God for Gary. 20 years faithful, prophesying to the guy next to him he's going to be the pastor. So all of a sudden you realize how to character formed? You persevere. You stay steady. You're committed to working things out. You know what I tell people at church? I say it this way. You know, there really should be nothing that could get me and you offended at each other that we couldn't work out if we were committed to Christ. But you know how many church fights I've seen in church? Oh, sometimes we're so unbecoming. Sometimes I think to myself, I don't know the difference between churches and bars. Because in bars, at least they go get filled with the spirits. <laughs> They sit at the bar and tell each other their problems. They gather regularly. If you notice some of those people, they, 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 there are some people at some bars that are more faithful than church people are, even through COVID. Maybe they think that the, maybe the alcohol washes it away. I don't know what they think. So God's saying, listen, I've got to give my church a new perspective, a new view of kingdom, because if they keep doing what they've always done, they're going to get the same results. So here's what I want you to know. His first mission for you individually, personally, your personal relationship with God is to change your character, to transform you into his image, that you would become more like Christ. And if you're not going to be like Christ and you want your own way and you want to be selfish, you're not full of him, you're full of you. And God's saying, I, I can use people that that, that yield to me, but I can use them better if they die to themselves and live for me. A lot of Christians today, I find out that want to live for the Lord. They want all the benefits of God, but listen, they don't want to die for Christ. And we need both today. Our young people, they need to know it's not just something we live for. It's something that we be willing to die for. The second thing that's important is that we need to develop skills. One of the things that happens when, when you're around other people is... You learn skills from each other. You, any, any, uh, any woodworkers in here? Anybody work in, in, in woodworking? Any contractors? Any engineers? Okay, over here. Any, any um, how about moms that stay home with their kids and raise their kids? Any, got any of those? Okay. Every single one of you are a gift from God. Every time I visit this church, I see something new and creative. Every time I come here, check this out. Isn't that amazing? This thing over here, I'm thinking, man, is this amazing? There's some creative people in here, and too often what we think is we think when I come to church, i got to leave everything out there and, and, quote, just be hallelujah, amen, glory to God, you know. Will you stop that? There's nothing wrong with using those terms, but the fact of the matter is God's saying, I've created you, listen, to represent me to a lost and dying world. And if you go up to your boss this week and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God, He's going to have a question about you. <laughs> I know what you mean. Your pastor knows what you mean. But isn't it true that we, we know how to move in a, a church service on Sunday and we know how to respond at work on Monday morning? Now, we can either become two people or we become the same person at church as we are on the outside. So we've got to develop our character, our competency, our skills, and then... I like to say chemistry or our communication. We grow, we develop, we mature as Christians. I used to have an administrator, not like Gary, but my administrator would be so focused on the task that he would walk right by people. And people in the church began to refer to him as a cold popsicle because that's what it was like. And so I took it on rather than get mad at him. I said, okay, I have that gift. I'm going to help you develop that gift. Let's learn how to, to value people. Let's how to learn how to put your task list down when people come around and acknowledge them. Look in their eyes. Shake their hands. Make, make a, a, a meaningful connection. Don't just be busy doing your stuff on a Sunday morning. I want you to focus on people. Well, he improved. He grew in that gift. 
because I had a gift. He didn't have a gift. I could help him with that gift. He had gifts that he helped me with. So all of a sudden, you begin to recognize that character, competency, and communication, our, our skills have to develop. And this is one of the places that God develops those skills with us. If you're always the last one in and the first one out and you want, don't want to be about people, then you're not going to get all that God has for you while you're here. Because there's people around you that have gifts that you don't have. And so Peter says we're put like in a rock tumbler. He puts us all in here in life song. Anybody remember what a rock tumbler was? It was like a round barrel and they'd put rocks in it and they'd turn it. And what would happen is when you pulled the rocks out, they were smooth and finished and they looked really cool. Friends, if you're not in the rock tumbler of God's church, then you just stay with an edge. You're not soft. You're hard. You're not tender or you don't look, people don't want to touch you. They want to avoid you. These are skills that are developed when we realize that every single person is valuable to God. And when you honor a gift, you know, it's amazing how those gifts can honor you back in your life. You hear the scripture, reap what you sow? Put that in people skills. I want to go to church. No one asked me for coffee. No one asked me to go after, after lunch. No one ever says this to me. No, 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 no. You're a baby. Because that's what babies do. They, they go through the motion and they whine and they complain and they didn't say hi to me and they didn't do this and they didn't invite me to coffee. Why don't you start inviting people to coffee, all right? There's a coffee pot right out there. I'll meet you in the foyer in five minutes. I'll be right there. Let's go, right? These are skills that develop because here's what I know. When I'm deficit in areas that I don't know, I want to find people who are strength or I'm weak. I'm not that smart, okay? I'm not that good. I've been at the same place 30 years, but I surround my... I don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I want to surround myself with sharp knives. Right? I don't, listen, I, I'm just not. So, so, but if I can be around other people who are really good in their areas, makes me even look better. Somebody say amen to that. <laughs> so here's what I know. With character, uh, it helps you to, uh, to avoid what I call the three Gs. Everybody say three Gs. Now, if you're a guy or a girl, it's going to change. One of the Gs is going to change, but I think you'll figure this out. When you develop godly character... Okay, the first thing you're not going to be tempted to do, listen, is, is try to touch his glory or to be prideful. Okay, God says, I resist the proud, but give grace to the humble. Second thing is, there's a desire in all of us to be with the opposite sex. And today, you know, in our world, it's with the same sex. So even that's it's strange to me because I think if people don't learn how to control themselves, anything goes. So God's saying to you, I want you to be able to endure the temptation of the opposite sex. And for some people, I would say the temptation of the same sex. So to, to me, the, the issue is if you have a lustful issue, it doesn't matter whether you're heterosexual or homosexual. Get control of your life. Not everyone belongs to you. Not everyone is for you. But you're to value all people. And the third one uh, has to do um, with gold. This is one of Steve's focuses. When you think gold, what do you think? God wants to make sure that you have a, a balanced financial life, that, that gold doesn't either control you or you're not a slave to it. So the three Gs are gold, girls, and glory. Pride, finances, and the opposite sex or the same sex. So all of a sudden... I realize then I don't have to go to church. I want to come to church because I get a new father. I get new brothers and sisters. We serve together. And because we serve together, we're all sharpening each other. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. I began to learn what Pastor Mike is good at. And then I go to Karen and say, okay, Mike's really good at this, but Karen is really good at this. I'm going to hang out with Karen. And so we're going to hang out with each other to gain. Now, I'm not using you. You're not using me. But in some ways, what happens is, we're learning to serve one another and we're to esteem each other higher than ourselves. And by honoring the other person, I'm learning what their strengths are and they're learning what my strength is. Somebody say amen. amen. By taking care of yourself or by being filled, you come to a point of overflow. Most people don't realize this, but I can have effective ministry when I learn to serve out of my overflow. 
When I, when I spend my time with God and my relationship with him in prayer, my relationship with him in the word, my relationship with sharing my faith, my relationship for caring for others, out of the flow of being obedient to God, I can become a greater blessing to people. Acts chapter 20 says it this way. Therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. If I'm going to have five healthy systems in the church, I'm going to have a system that says our our lead pastor, our lead shepherd, who cares about his people, he can't do it all, so I want to be on that team, pastor. Help me, teach me, train me how to care for other people appropriately so that all of us can grow and learn. Now, let's back all this up. The Old Testament, I'm going to kind of condense this now, but the Old Testament, basically, after the sin of Adam and Eve, God's plan was to get his people back. Remember, they had to leave the garden. They were cast out of the garden. That's where God's presence was. And so his plan was to to tell Moses, Moses, I want you to put a tent in the desert. Now, the tent, or they called it a tabernacle, was God's presence would be in the tent, right? So let's gather to God's presence. Everybody needs to get back. Get back to the garden? No. Get into the tent? No, it was about his presence. His presence was in the garden, right? Moses said the presence is is in the tent, right? 400 years later, we come up and then Solomon builds a temple. Now the idea there is God said the presence is going to be in the temple. So we're going to gather people to the temple. He says, whoever comes to this place and prays, I'm going to put a blessing on them. Not just to my people, but all people who come here. But then you get to the New Testament. And the New Testament Apostle Paul begins to use same temple language. And he says, don't you know that now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? What I want you to begin to see is, Too many people today in the church are not thinking about the church as a kingdom. They're thinking about it as trying to get people to a tent, trying to get people to a temple, trying to get people to a barn, trying to get people to a building. Try to, listen to me, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So God's plan, and this is why we the county is so important today, it was a prophetic call to certain people who will respond, who will not just wait for the people on the outside to change policy to come into the church. It was a call to get people, listen, with character, competency, and chemistry, people skills, to get into the marketplace so that we can bring Christ's presence where the people are. See, this is, this is the mind shift change. Before COVID, right, this was, this is what was the fun thing about COVID. Before COVID, it's let's get people to church. Let's get people to church. Let's get people to church. COVID, nobody can come to church. Well, let's not go back to the old way. Let's recognize that the church is mobilized wherever you go. And instead of waiting for an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher in the church, do you realize that you're going to reach somebody at your job or your school Wherever you are, you can reach them better than we can here in the church. My job is not to be the outreach pastor. My job is to find someone who will train in outreach. So that makes you as valuable as me. Catch this. I have a gift. I have to be obedient. But God made you just as valuable as the minister, as the pastor, so that you can fulfill his purpose in the marketplace. Now, there will be some who will do both. There are people, I call them kings. Those are the people that that can bring in the support. And then the priests are the ones who minister inside the, the house. But the fact is, many of us, the Bible says, should be kings and priests. So we need people in the marketplace, not just in the church. And if you're like the Amish or you like some of the others, uh, you create a whole culture within your culture that other people can't relate to. And you stay away from them, and they stay away from you, and that's how most churches are. Stay away from those ungodly people. How about this? How about you be so passionate about Jesus that you go be dropped in the midst of a, a, a perverse generation, and you still have the aroma of Christ on you? What if, what if God's plan wasn't say, hey, we're going to really start with revival when everyone comes to church, and say, revival is going to happen when the the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is you, 
those outside the church. Sunday mornings, we're celebrating, we're growing, we're encouraging, we're supposed to be helping each other. This isn't a place for selfish people. This is a place where we prefer each other, honor each other, help each other, encourage each other. Bring our kids with us. Let our kids see us worship, modeling Christian behavior so that other people can see that real Christians know how to live inside the church and they know how to live outside the church. The building, this building is a step along the path that prepared the people of God to become the temple. Their crucial role in God's plan to dwell with humanity. If you identify as a Christ follower today, your role remains the same. You are an ancient building, God's temple, and God walks with his people. The scripture says, he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you, right? But we always think about that in terms of church. Let's go to church and he'll never leave me. Let's go to church, he'll never forsake me. No, 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 he's with you, so wherever you go, you take his presence. And when people encounter his presence, they might ask you, where are you going to church? Because they see that God has developed in you character, competency, and communication skills. This is the training, equipping, preparation center for us to go out. So rather than go back to pre-COVID days and think that the job of the church is to get everybody here, forget about that. Twelve people changed the course of the world. God sent you guys up here to change, first of all, start with the whole thumb. Is that the Fonzie anointing? Hey. I'm dating myself a little bit. That's an old reference to Fonzie and the happy days, right? But we can't go back to the happy days. We've got to come to a new place and recognizing this is, our, this is our center of operations. And when we come, yes, his presence is here because the presence is in each of us. And when we all come together, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we shout and we celebrate. And we think, man, God is so good. And we're going to pray healing and deliverance. And people are going to get free, saved, healed, delivered. But this is one day a week where the other six days a week we're supposed to be out rubbing shoulders with other people. And so, well, I can't do that, Pastor. I'll go back to my old ways. You need a father. You don't need church sanity. You need Christianity because it was the power of Christ living in you, training you and teaching you how to observe all things and how to resist temptation. Well, Pastor, I can't go. I can't go over there. It's just too much of a temptation. Well, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to become mature? I, I'm tired of hearing excuses of why. You know what? Listen, when I, when I first got saved, I, I got to be honest, there was a season in my life where I was around all Christians all the time. But then they start talking funny. We all say the same stuff and we all use the same words and we, and we get this little bubble. But I stayed in the army particularly for 10 years because I really liked being around sinners. Pastor Mike, your, a lot of your skills were developed pre-church when you were a chef. And people all over the state know him because he trained them and equipped them. And I run, we go to a restaurant sometimes and some guys in the back kitchen will come out and say, this is the guy that trained me. It was his skills. And then guess who he, <laughs> guess who he had to hire because she had skills? Karen. Amen. Karen had all these skills, and he's like, if I've got skills, you know, we got skills, and together, what do their skills do? You're talking about a couple chefs over here, food prep and running a restaurant. Why are they pastoring? Well, didn't the Bible say taste and see that the Lord is good? <laughs> they know how to serve. Somebody said to me today, this is a special day. We got donuts back, Pastor Dave. I go, yes. Oh, oh, over, over the years, pastors, I have literally grown with you, pastor. I have grown over the years with you. Listen, the initial glimpse of the temple language occurs in the first image bearers in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. Images of God's, uh, gods typically took the form of idols placed in ancient temples, Genesis 1 and 2. God created human, humanity to dwell with him and bear his image to the world. For a brief moment, there was no need for a temple structure. All humankind lived in harmony with each other, nature and God. 
But the picture that comes is once they separated from God, they were dispersed. So they're gathered together under Moses' leadership. They're gathered under David's leadership and Solomon. We get to the New Testament. The Bible says now we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So think about this. Going outside the church into the marketplace for most of us is a cold call. If you're a salesman, you know what that means, a cold call. It means that you have no reference or connection to them. Uh, It's just cold. So we're going to talk to somebody about the Lord, and we don't even know if they're saved, and it doesn't always go well. But if you and I were sent out of the church and there was a big sign over the door on the way out that said you are now entering the mission field and God goes with you and his presence can encounter people throughout your day, those aren't cold calls, those are connections. And God will use your connections to grow the church. We keep thinking if Pastor Dave or Pastor Mike, if we preach better, we'll get more people. Eh, Wrong answer. It's, we're, I've been preaching for 40, almost 40 years now. I'm probably not going to get a whole lot better. I just, I just got to tell my church that once in a while. I'm probably not going to get... But listen, you might reach some people I could never reach. And if every one of you, listen, if every one of you went out this year, just one year, and reached one person in a year, do you know that in one year's time we would double the church? It's a different perspective because we think, well... Bring Pastor Mike, bring, let Pastor Mike pray with them. Let Pastor Mike preach. Let Pastor Mike uh, lay hands on them. Why? We're supposed to be equipping you for that. I am good at that. I, I love sharing my faith. I, I love reading the Bible. I, I've got some skills. Your pastors have some skills. But don't, make, don't put them on a pedestal and make them be what you want them to be. Let them be who God created them to be. Listen, so that you can fulfill what you're called to be. Somebody say amen to that. So the tent, the tent, the temple, then uh, the Bible uses a terminology called that he tabernacled amongst us or uh, there's tents among us. God meets us in the tent or the tabernacle, but now he's in us. Just when we thought the story was coming to a tragic end, Jesus arrives on the scene. In fact, when the gospel writer John describes Jesus, he states that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. A lot of people today will say to me, Pastor Dave, I, I just want to I just want to get in the Word. And, and, and if you want to get closer to Jesus, get in the Word. Because He is the Word. And if we're honest right now, some of you would say you watch more television than you spend time with the Word. Because in our society today, people are literally watching TV by the by the weeks, by the months. And there's so many temptations to watch all kinds of stuff that are, we shouldn't even be watching. But we've, we've, we've watered ourselves down a little bit. What you could watch 10, 20, 20 years ago is nothing compared to what's on the, on the computer and what's on the television today. And yet we say we, we want to be Christians. Thank God for your desire to be a Christian, but God moves us beyond our desire. He moves us to a place of commitment. I want to avoid certain things because I want to reach more people for Christ. So I can go be with people who are non-Christians and not let them affect me. Listen, if I can have a place to come to at least once a week where I can be around other believers who have the same goal as I do. That's why church is important. I want to find out where your skills are. I want to learn from you. I want to grow from you. I want to honor you. I want to value you. I want to do things together. I want to serve. You know, some of our men today, we're talking with uh, Steve again. We're, we're saying, men come to church. I, on the most part, you'll find out that there's usually more women serving in a lot of churches today than men. I'm not down on either one. Thank God for the women. But the idea there is sometimes men don't want to come and just sit. They want to do something. They want to put their hands to something. They want to be a part of something. And so that's what we're trying to do today. We're not going to go back and say, I'm looking for a bunch of people that will come and sit for an hour on their butt and clap their hands and say, that was awesome, Pastor Dave. The reality is you brought your family today to be filled full of his word. And the Bible says, watch this, that you and I are washed with the water of the word. The world can be washed off of us Ever think about that? Think about the disciples. Back in the day, remember they, if you read, they, they used to do foot washing? Okay, now I know you wash your feet, so it's not a weird thing. Okay, you wash your feet, I wash my It's just one of those things we do. And if not, other people can smell them, but whatever. 
But if you were in Palestine during the days of Jesus, you'd be walking through the desert and you'd be stepping in all kinds of things and you didn't have full shoes on and socks like we do today. You're probably barefooted or a pair of sandals or something just on the bottom of the feet so the stones don't hurt your skin. But the fact of the matter is there's animal poop everywhere. And so when you'd come up to their house, can you wash those before you come in? My kids are going to be playing in here. I don't want that stuff all over the house. Wash your feet. So they wash their feet, right? You and I, when we come into the house of God, listen, through his, through his word, the Bible says we are washed by the water of his word. And all of a sudden, I'm getting closer to God and I'm exchanging my old ways for new ways. And I recognize then it's not just pat me on the back because I got the church. That's where a lot of Americans are today. Pat me on the back just because I went to church today. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you go to McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac. (laughs) God's plan, listen, was to get you here for a purpose. And to get you here is so that you and I would be washed in the water of the word. We'd renew our minds. And so we're transforming our hearts and our hearts begin to be the kind of people that know how to operate inside the church and know how to operate outside the church. Well, I can't go out there. There's bad people out there. Let me tell you something. I've been around in the church, our church 30 years. There's bad people in my church. See, we, you all look like sheep, but I bet there might be a goat in here. I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to judge you, but you can tell by people's actions. Because a goat butts people. They're always butting people. They're always looking for controversy. They're always trying to ram somebody. They're always trying to jab somebody. They're always trying to get their own way. Hopefully there's none in here. John goes on the record, Jesus referring to his own body as the temple, saying that it will be destroyed but rebuilt in three days. He's talking about his physical body. At Jesus' crucifixion, the curtain that was shielded in the inner room of the temple is torn... What was the significance of that event? The authors of Hebrews tell us that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that accomplished what the temple in Jerusalem could never do. Jesus, listen, tore the veil of your heart. He tore the veil of your eyes, your blindness, your deafness spiritually. And he opens you up to a brand new life and says, wherever you go, I'm going to go with you. Go to church, listen, go to a place to get equipped and trained but don't ever mistakenly think that it's by going to church that saves me, heals me, delivers me. It is going into God's presence that does that. And I'm supposed to take that wherever I go. Somebody say amen to that. I'm going to ask Allie uh, and uh, Andy to come up here real quickly and uh, give a quick testimony. These are a couple that came to our church like, like most of you. We start coming and uh, we start coming to church. And I, I want you to see the, the testimony real quickly of of what their life was like before Christ, their encounter with Christ, and now God's using them today. Why don't you guys go ahead? Awesome. Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. It's it's really great to be here. I'm going to just start by saying thank you because there's life in this church. The second I walked into the door, you guys were so generous. You greeted us. I am blessed to be here. This has blessed me today. So let me start. We're going to rewind. What Pastor Dave doesn't know is he asked me to do this, and I'm I, once you start, once I start talking, you guys, it's not good. So I'm going to try to do the cliff note version. Okay. So rewind to about 2013, Andy and I meet, and we both grew up as Catholics. We were going to Catholic churches. We would serve in Catholic churches. Um, but as we got older, kind of faded away, would go here and there. Um, we actually were engaged. We have a very unique story, so that's actually where I'm going to start because it really led and propelled my journey with the Lord. So we were dating, got engaged, and actually broke off our engagement in 2015. Um, I graduated from college. I moved away, and for the first time, like I had a new city, new job, new everything in my life was new. I was feeling very lost, really lost. And I got to a place where I just, I needed the Lord. It was the first time I ever went to a Christian church, um, and it was just something different something different about it. Um, What I didn't know in the midst of that is that God was starting to continue to equip and prepare me because as I continued, I was living downstate at this point. There are a lot of things that happened. I'll skip all of that stuff. But in 2017, the Lord brought Andy and I back together. 
And so he was equipping and preparing me through that whole season for what was about to come and what has led us to where we are today. So I'll let Andy tell that part. Okay. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Andy, um, Allie's husband. Um, to kind of continue where Allie was taking the story, I guess, um, to give you a little bit of my background, I'm going to go back to 2016. I had actually just moved to Bay City. Um, I began working at a car dealership. Um, it took me a couple of months, got my feet underneath me, started doing well there. Really thought I was starting to find my place in the world. Um, but as I started to grow there and thought I was finding my place in the world, I started living for the world. Um, and I, and as a, as a result, I started giving in to some of the wrong influences um, that kind of took me down a wrong path and really took me away from God. Um, and as Ali said, we got back together uh, by the grace of the Lord in 2017. Um, but the combination for me really hit uh, early 2018. I had drifted so far away from God. Um, there was one night I remember I was going to a party store uh, to chase the wrong kind of spirits. <laughs> um, and then as, as I was driving home, just something hit me and I broke down. And I said, I don't know who I am anymore. And that was a real awakening for me. And I have to thank God for Allie because she's actually the one who started to encourage me to come back to church. Um, and then about a month later, uh, March of 2018, we started attending Bay Valley Christian Church. And uh, we gave our lives to Christ um, shortly after we started attending. Uh, we were water baptized uh, November 2018. And from there, the Lord really started doing his restorative work in our relationship, in our marriage, in our lives. It's pretty awesome. Awesome. That's awesome, guys. Thank you. Take that back, Pastor. So, so I tell you that story because basically I'm not talking about a dead religion that we're a part of. I'm talking about you guys know that there is a life in Christ. We all struggle. We all have our issues. We all have problems that we've got to overcome, and we can't do it on our own. But we've got to find Christ, and then we've got to find, uh, get fathered by a new father. We need new brothers and sisters in Christ, and we begin then to rub each other sometimes the right way and sometimes the wrong way, but iron sharpens iron, and I began to be on a journey then of restoration, restoring uh, the old. Oh, I turned my, my ashes in for his beauty. And we never fully arrive, right? We always have issues. I, I, as a pastor and my wife, we, we still have issues. We have to still work through stuff. But the reality there is, if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, I got to quit waiting to get fixed when I get to church and realize, listen, it's the six days outside of church that I'm to be growing and maturing and conforming to the image of Christ. I come on the weekends to celebrate and be around brothers and sisters in Christ. So let me wrap this whole thing up. Uh, community. When you come to Christ, there's also that community, that communi uh, there is an uh, inbuilt communal aspect of being part of God's family. Paul uses the metaphor body of Christ to describe the Christian community. There's an inherent assumption of teamwork. We're supposed to cooperate and, and uh, work together. You know, think about it. When people fight all the time in church, and I don't like this, I don't like the color of these chairs, I don't want this, I don't want that, that's fleshly, it's carnal. We've got to look beyond some of these small things. We've got to look at the big picture. And that is God's wanting revival, but revival starts in you. And when you and I realize that I can't change anybody else, I can't fix anybody else, I don't heal anybody else, my job is to pray, it's God's job to heal. It takes some of the pressure off. Because now all I get to do is do whatever God tells me to do. Finally, his presence, the temple is where God, God dwells with his people through the, throughout the biblical story. So we are the temple of God. That means it is through these people that God reaches the world. He reaches the world through you. People travel far and wide and encounter God at the temple in Jerusalem. But now the people of God are the temple and God takes his presence to the world. So make a long story short this morning, folks. God started by regathering at the tent, regathering at the temple. He gathers now in uh, in us, the Bible said that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And if we'll be about our Father's business, you and I will begin to see things and do things that was prophesied about. If Jesus can take 12 people and change the world, what could he do with this many people? This is a big number. This many people who have the presence of God living in them that go out weekly and impact their community, their schools, their work, their, their, the marketplace. 
we began to recognize that the church isn't over. And when the enemy tried to keep us quiet during COVID and keep us down and keep us out of church, we've awakened a sleeping giant. Just like Pearl Harbor days, remember? All of a sudden, you began to recognize this is going to be our greatest hour. More people can be reached with Christ. Why? Because you become a worthy vessel, loved and honored by Jesus, and welcome and celebrated in the church. So for some of you people who are on uh, uh, video today, let me just say this, after a year, it's enough time. Uh, we love and appreciate you. It's time to get back to the house of God. Let's be about our Father's business and see the transformation come, uh, just as we did today with 20 years of prophecy. Gary was up here being ordained as one of the pastoral team, one of the pastoral staff, and uh, we could celebrate him, but guess what? We get to celebrate each other. Every one of you are a gift, and we need all the gifts to get the job done. Somebody say amen to that.